Good evening, everybody. Welcome to JWA's Book Talks. I'm Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. As always, very glad to be here with you tonight. This is the third session of our March Book Talk series. Um, please, as always, say hello in the chat box. Make sure to chat to everyone so we can see who's with us. We'd love to know who's with us in the room. Also, remember that throughout the conversation, you can add questions there, and I will try to pull them into our conversation. We're so glad to be able to continue this learning together. Um, a few words about JWA for anyone who's new to us. We are a digital archive that expands and transforms the way we understand history and Jewish culture by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. Um, we do this because we believe that uncovering a more diverse and nuanced story helps us create a better world. So thank you for being our partners in doing that. The book talks are just one aspect of JWA's work. I hope you will check out jwa.org and explore the enormous range of materials there. I assure you, you can fall down all kinds of wonderful, terrific rabbit holes there, and I encourage you to do so. Um, one logistical note very quickly, if you would like captioning, you can click the button that says CC or show captions, um, and that should hopefully turn that on for you. Okay, I am delighted to introduce this evening's author. Lulwa Khazoum pioneered the Jewish multicultural movement in 1990, launching numerous organizations through which she provided groundbreaking educational programs throughout the United States. She also published Jewish multicultural articles in both, in both Jewish and mainstream media, helping further shift public consciousness and catalyze recognition of and value for Jewish diversity. So very much uh, work that we value and build on. The first edition of her book that we'll be talking about tonight, The Flying Camel, Essays on Identity by Women of North African and Middle Eastern Jewish Heritage, was the first anthology by Jewish women of color, has been taught at universities worldwide. Lulwa has been an activist for her whole life. In the 80s, at the age of 14, she <laughs> led an uprising in the women's section of her Mizrahi synagogue. In the early 1990s, she was the first woman to publicly lead Sephardi Mizrahi prayers. And today she combines Iraqi Jewish prayers with original alternative rock and meditative music through her two musical groups. You can see some of their posters on the back behind her, mm -hmm. Iraqis in Pajamas and Shaddai mm -hmm. Chants. Drawing from her original music and poetry, personal storytelling and educational materials, she offers multimedia programs live and online. And you can learn more about her at kazoom.com. K-H-A-Z-Z-O-O-M.com, and we'll send uh, links later. Welcome, Lula. So glad Thank to you. have you with us here. Hello. Good to be here. Um, so I know that this book has been on quite a journey. You published the second edition recently in 2022, but I know you started working on it actually 30 years earlier in 1992 yeah. and published the original version in 2003. So tell us a little bit about how and why you created this book and what it means to be re-releasing it now. Sure. So I started doing Jewish multicultural work in 1990. And back then, people didn't have any point of reference for any of it. It was just coming out of left field. And I found that because there was such little recognition of or value for Jewish multiculturalism at that time, there was no room to get into hard conversations. It's like I had to figure out a way to package things so that people would be interested in it and open to it. So if I came in and I was like, let's talk about Jew on Jew racism, let's talk about, you know, people would be like, go away. So I found that I had to keep kind of um, shutting down my own story. Like I couldn't just talk very straightforward. I had to always do this PR dance. And what that meant was that while I did insist on hard conversations, I did it in a way that was palatable, that was engaging, that wouldn't you know, overwhelm or upset people. And I couldn't talk about my experience in life because I had gone through a lot of hard things in the Jewish community. Um, you know, it, it was kind of like, I felt like a a ping pong, not a ping pong ball. What do you call it? Those um, arcade machines, the pinball, you okay. know, that it was, it was kind of like shunted from one place to the other. So in the Jewish world, I was Middle Eastern and female in the Middle Eastern world. And, you know, in the Middle Eastern world, I was a Jew and a woman. And then in the Middle Eastern Jewish world, I was a woman. And in the mainstream world, I was a Jew and a woman and a Middle Easterner. And it was like anywhere that I went, 
there was no consciousness about all of the intersections. There was no awareness about, you know, that even that we existed, you know, never mind like that we were relevant. And then even when there was a small smattering of consciousness, it was, for example, like in a Jewish bookstore, there would be like a tiny section of Sephardic books. So it was a special interest and it was really small and it didn't cover hardly anything. So that was the environment in which I started doing this work. And even at a very young age, um, I was experiencing racism in the Jewish community, some really outrageous things. I had a lot of pain from the experience. Um, you know, as a child, I hated Ashkenazim. I'm just gonna be honest because it was just, it was so awful and it was so incessant. And so I found that I couldn't talk about me. I couldn't talk like from me. I had to always be the educator, the presenter, the public relations manager. And again, it feels before I continue in that direction, I wanna say it, it feels important to me to say that I always, as I said before, I always insisted on having the hard conversations, mm -hmm. but I was really careful about how I approached it. So for example, I would say, you know, and, and this was true, but I made sure that I emphasized this instead of coming from a place of anger, which was, you know, you're all a product of your own Jewish education. So when you've only learned about Jews from Germany or Russia or Poland, you can't suddenly turn around and be teaching about Jews from Ethiopia and Mexico and Yemen. I mean, you, you can't, you just, you don't have the knowledge or resources or skills to do that. And that's not your fault. You know, so I came more from that perspective, um, you know, and I would talk about Jew on Jew racism, but again, I do it in a really compassionate way. So it was like, I had to step into a role of leader and educator. And I couldn't be like, let me talk about my life. Let me talk about my experience. Let me talk about my pain. Let me talk about my anger. There was no room for that. The other thing was because nobody else was doing this kind of work at the time, like the landscape back then was you had either, you know, everyone was lumped under Sfardim if you weren't Ashkenazi. So the Sfardim were either assimilating and just completely whitewashing and becoming Ashkenazi and being part of the mainstream, or they were this separatist typically very angry, small community off to the side. That was the landscape. And to me, even really young, as a teenager, I was like, that's not acceptable. Like there needs to be a united Jewish friend. Like either we're Jews or we're not Jews. If we're Jews, we have a lot of work to do on getting our act together because most Jews are not included. And we need to have a wider consciousness about who Jews are, what it means to be Jewish. And if, instead of this kind of us, them, I wanted it to be in all of us and interconnecting threads, kind of like a tree, you know, the roots and then you branch out, but it's all part of the same tree. So mm -hmm. that was my vision. Anyhow, so after a couple of years of this, I was just really tired of, you know, where, when do I get to talk? Like, when do I get to just kind of sit down with a cup of coffee and tell someone my story? And Right, I decided to write an article. For, you're all always working for the better of the community and not like getting to meet your own needs necessarily. Bam, thank you, yes. And so I wrote an article called A Bridge Between Different Worlds. And it was basically, you know, that the metaphor that I used of the pinball machine, I was talking about what that felt like, that I had these kind of three different identities that nobody ever wanted to allow to be one. It was always over here, over here, over here. And well, you don't belong anywhere. And I was actually like, well, I belong everywhere and I'm seeing things that you're not seeing because I'm at the intersections and you're not. So maybe you can instead allow me to help you see some things that you might not be aware of. So I wrote an article, like I said, called A Bridge Between Different Worlds. And I submitted it to a whole lot of magazines and nobody wanted to publish it. And that really frustrated me because the reason that nobody wanted to publish it, you know, kind of the responses I got was the same issue that I was encountering, which is people are ignorant. They don't value this. They don't, they don't even get it that they don't get it. You know, I used to say in the early nineties when I would go to uh, synagogues or Jewish community organizations and I would approach the leaders and I would offer a Jewish multicultural workshop. I had to give them a workshop in order for them to understand that they needed a workshop. <laughs> right. And so it was the same kind of thing. It's like the, the rationale I was giving of why this doesn't fit their needs. I was like, well, that's the point of the article. <laughs> you completely missed the point of the article. Right. I was frustrated. I was angry. 
Now that, I'm gonna just kind of jump in the future a little bit. That article ended up getting published in Bridges Magazine, which was one of the first, it's a, it, I don't think it's in existence anymore, but it was a Jewish feminist journal. It's and not, one of the first- it's fabulous. Yeah, it was one of the first to talk about a lot of issues for Jewish women that were not getting talked about. And it was one of the first Jewish media to you know, start publishing articles like mine about Jewish diversity. So, but, but I didn't know that at this time, um, you know, months and months went by, nobody wanted my article. And I, and like I said, I was frustrated and I was angry and, uh, you know, I'm not sure what language I'm allowed to use here. You know, I'm punk rock. So but I'll say, you know, F you, I was like, right. you know what, to hell with this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm going to do a book and I'm going to, I'm going to get a bunch of other Miser Heinz Friday women, and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to be really real and we're going to call everything out. And I was all pumped. I'm like, this is, this, you know, I'm congratulating myself. This is an awesome idea, Lula. You know? And then I was like, okay. And then I was like, wait, I don't know anyone except me and my sister <laughs> who are Mizrahi feminists, like not one. The right. only affiliated Mizrahi and Sephardi women that I knew at the time were Orthodox. And they were perfectly happy sitting behind a four foot wall and not knowing stuff. I never was. I never was okay with that. Um, I mean, just a little side note that when I was apparently three, I don't remember this, but my parents told me this. When I was three, I was painting checkers with my dad and he goes, hi, I got a king. And I said, it's a queen. I've just been like this my whole life. Right. <laughs> so I never accepted the way things were done. I was like, that's not okay. I could lead prayers in the Iraqi tradition with the Iraqi accent, which was like unheard of for my generation. Um, and I could do that when I was eight years old, but that was rejected because I was a girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I was a boy, whoa, the community would have been so excited that, you know, this young child is so passionate on the legacy. about our heritage, but it was completely disregarded. It was like worthless because I was a girl. So those are the kinds of things that I was dealing with growing up. So around that time that I was thinking about this, I started having some self-doubt because I thought, well, who am I to say that this is a problem? If I'm the only person, you know, that I know other than my sister, if I'm the only person who's like, you know, and I've always been more of a hothead than my sister. So, you know, if I'm the only person who's yelling about this, do I even have the right? I started having this self-doubt. And I went to a movie. I was, at that time, I was really into going to a lot of um, talks and, you know, art exhibits and whatever that would really push open envelopes. And, and I love that. And so I was at a, a film, an indie film screening. And this woman who was from India, um, you know, became a hothead of feminist at some point in her life went back to India and did a film. She came from a very small village and the women there were only annoyed at her. Why mm. are you doing this? And she was trying to like give a perspective of the oppression of women in her village. And the only response constantly in the film, they were like, what is your problem? Like this, this is you, you're the only person who has a problem with this. And I was just like, oh my God, I have to talk to this person. And so I, I, you know, when there was Q&A afterwards, I stood up and, and, and I said, you know, I'm having this same thing. It's like, do I have this right? And somebody said to me, I don't remember, like, I guess after when we were milling around, somebody said to me, oh, you should meet Ella Shohat. I didn't know her at the time. Um, and, you know, she's this hot-headed Iraqi Israeli feminist professor. And um, so I'm like, cool. So I reached out to her. Another thing that happened was um, there was a woman in San Francisco who wrote a scathing letter to the editor. Um, apparently there was something, you know, the, the Jewish papers were just always completely like bagels and cream cheese. I mean, just, we did not exist mm -hmm. back then. And she wrote a scathing letter to the editor. She was like, I've had it. This, this article you wrote just goes on like Yiddish is the, the Jewish language. And she's like, we exist here's my story. And she was like mad as hell. And it was great. And her name's Rachel Waba. And so I reached out to her. So it was like one here, one there, you know, in Israel, in the United States, just, I, I was very out there. I, you know, I, like you said, I've been an activist since I was a child. 
So I was very out there, very engaged in community and constantly talking about this. So and you were so, basically like you building the community places. that you needed to support you in doing this work. Say building, that again? You were basically like assembling the, the, the tribe that you needed to support you in doing this work. I love how you say that. Yeah, to me, it felt like I created a watering hole and people started coming to it. And so when it started, you know, I didn't have anywhere near enough people to fill a book. And by the time, you know, it had rolled through, um, you know, and, and it got published in 2003, I was turning essays away. I had too many yeah. um, because word got out. And this was before the internet. So this was like, I mean, the internet may have existed somewhere, but wasn't anywhere in my life, you know, so I barely had a computer at that point. So, so, you know, it was very like old school word of mouth. Um, and then what happened was, I, um, you know, so it, it kind of went through this journey, as you said. So in the beginning, the first, the first version, I finished editing um, in the early 90s. And, um, and then I started trying to publish it and nobody wanted it. The exact same responses I got when I tried to publish that article. It was maddening. I went to the Jewish press, to the feminist press, to the people of color press. I was told we had to have Mizrahi men in it. I was told we had to have Ashkenazi women in it. I was told we had to have non-Jewish women of color in it. Basically, everybody was saying, you are not enough. You are not worthy of your own book. We don't care what you have to say. You have to bring in somebody else that we actually care about in order to justify having a book. And, you know, I was in my early 20s. I didn't have any experience back then, you know, publishing I really wanted the book to be published. So every time I get something like that, it was a test of integrity. Because if I did what they said, I had the possibility of publishing the book. And I was just like, absolutely not. Every time I was like, no, no, this is just offensive. No, 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 and no. So basically I could wallpaper my entire apartment with the rejection letters. I'm relentless. I ended up, you know, fast forward a few decades, I ended up running a PR company. And I've always been able to get people in the media who couldn't get in the media because I'm like a bulldog. I mean, I, when I want something, I go after it and I do not stop. Mm -hmm. So I kept pitching here, there, the other place, everywhere, everywhere I could possibly pitch. Nobody wanted it. Not one place. Then 9-11 happened. Then I had seven top literary agents fighting over it. In fact, the book was originally called Behind the Veil of Silence. But suddenly after 9-11, you've got behind the veil, above the veil, below the veil, my dog's wearing a veil, everything's about veil. And I had to change the name of the book. <laughs> and I ended up publishing it with, it, and it was interesting, it was an interesting experience. I went, to, I went to New York, that's where most of the agents were. There was also an agent in San Francisco that wanted the book. One of them was promising me a lot of money. And I had a friend who published a book with her, so I knew she could deliver on her promise, but I did not trust her. Hmm. And there was another agent who she had a much more modest, like really modest, like not even coming close to covering expenses, you know, that, that that's what she was gonna get, but I trusted her. Hmm. And it was really important to me that the women's stories would remain pure. Um, again, back then in that environment, even that was like 10 years, 13 years after I started doing this work, still there was like, such a lack of understanding and consciousness and a lack of the fact that there was a lack of understanding or consciousness, which is dangerous because then people can think they're doing you a favor when they're editing your stuff and they're really just decimating it. Right. So I chose the person that my heart felt this woman is looking out for the book. Like she got it. She loved it. She wasn't Jewish. She was like super waspy, but she, you know, and to me, that's, I mean, that's a whole other side conversation, but to me, it's really about where the heart is. Like, mm -hmm. like, I don't really care what someone's identity is. I care that someone is in it and they get it. Right. Um, and then I ended up publishing it with Seal Press. Like, um, she, you know, she, she pitched it to Seal among other places. And I had pitched Seal Press five years earlier. They were the one of the publishing companies that rejected it. But, you know, it's kind of like there's this, there's this buzz now, like the whole manifesting movement. Like you think your reality and you create the reality. I'm like, that is such crap. You know, and I think you have to be a pioneer in something in order to understand how 
untrue that is. Because sometimes there just has to be a shift in consciousness. You're doing right. the exact same thing you were doing forever. People just were not ready for it. The environment was not right. So yeah. unfortunately, it took something that disastrous to wake people up. But you know, suddenly they wanted to know about the Middle East and Middle Eastern women. And, you know, so Jewish, Middle Eastern Jewish women got thrown in the mix. Yeah. Um, I love that image of creating the watering hole for people to gather. And I think one of the things that's really beautiful and powerful about the book is that you can very like palpably feel that it's people who are looking for something who haven't found, you know, who are who are trying to find their people or find the people who can understand what they're struggling with. And also the book is really honest about the challenges of that, right? That like yeah. you can go to something looking, thinking, oh, these are going to be my people and discover actually it's really complicated. And you have yeah. a great essay in the book about going to your first Mizrahi feminist yeah. conference and coming with all these hopes and dreams, like, okay, these are going to be my people. And finally, I'm going to be surrounded by other people. And then realizing there were still all these divisions and yeah. you were too American or other people didn't want to engage with religion and realizing that there were, you know, or realizing that like in the Israeli community, there were divisions between Mizrahim and Ethiopian Jews and, yeah. and like the pain of recognizing like, oh, it's actually going to be harder. And yeah. I was struck by that, by that, by like the way in which you were able to both capture the fact that there was this kind of search for home that was happening and be really honest about the challenges of it. Yeah, and it's interesting you brought that up because, you know, ultimately, you know, I used to be very political and really like, you know, hot headed about identity and, you know, and whether it's, you know, Jew or Mizrahi or, you know, feminist or whatever. And now I hide in a forest and, <laughs> and I'm very into like individuality because at the end of the day, you know, that pinball thing just got deeper and deeper and deeper because then, like you said, at the Mizrahi Feminist Conference, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't that they thought I was too American. It's that the fact that I was American, they presumed meant that I'm Anglo-Saxon of all things, which is crazy because I grew up with this enforced inferiority complex because I was not Anglo-Saxon. They were calling me Anglo-Saxon. I was like, Right, which in yeah, Israel just like, means you speak English, Lula right? Hazum. Like what right. Anglo-Saxon is named Lula Hazum? Let's just, let's just start there. I mean, look at all my curls. What are you talking right. about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, look at my profile, you know? So it, it was really nuts. Um, and I just had more and more and more that even within the book, even women within the book, not, a, I'm not going to talk about it publicly, but it's just like, it's like the Russian doll. It's like, as you get deeper in and deeper in and deeper in, it's like, wait, it doesn't end. And then I ultimately, for me, I realized, you know, really it's about the individual soul and how we have processed or not processed our wounding and our trauma. And that ended up being the direction that my work took after that. So where I'm at now, and I talk about this in the 2022 introduction, where I'm at now, I don't fly the Jew flag or Mizrahi flag or feminist flag. Now I am all of that and more like, I mean, you know, every other word out of my mouth. I mean, you know, you can't be around me and not encounter all of that, but it's not like my, how do I say this? It's not like my package. It's not my identity card. Like I'm just very me and me is a whole lot of things um that other people will be like you know that's really hardcore feminist i'm getting i feel like i'm rambling so let me give you an example where i feel like i can be more concrete about it or more articulate um a few years ago like maybe uh, four years ago like before the pandemic i gave a performance and you know i i feel i've made this profound shift where i used to be super political and now I feel I'm not. Now I'm just really personal, super duper personal. And I used to have an agenda, you know? I was an educator, I persuaded people. I had the power suit and the PowerPoint. And now I just share my story. And I'm really okay, whatever you wanna do with my story, that's fine by me. 
Right. But that's the most feminist lesson, right? Like the most feminist lesson is that the personal is political and that just by sharing your story, you're unearthing all this other systemic stuff. And that, that is a way of being political. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So I, I did this, I did this performance and, you know, my perception was I'm super not political now. I'm just super personal. And then a bunch of people from the performance went and hung out after. And this guy was like, wow, you're like really political. And I was like, what? No, I'm not. I'm specifically not political. And he said, exactly. And because of that, you are because you disarm people because you're so personal that I didn't have any reaction. Like a lot of things I would have had a reaction to, I didn't because you were really just really authentic and personal, but the things you say are really radical. And because you didn't have an agenda and I felt that I took it in and it's like made me think about things. And that really blew my mind, you know, that I was like, here, I thought I was just so not political. So I'm just bringing that up to say, you know, whereas I used to be very into like gravitating toward the Jewish community, the feminist community, I don't even believe there is a community anymore. Because when you get down into the layers and you challenge the BS that is inevitably in every single community, and you find people are always kind of like, well, we're this and you're that. And I don't know why people do that. But ultimately, I ended up deciding, you know, I just, I know who I am. And I have all these component parts. So like, you know, I sing punk rock that has Iraqi Jewish prayers, right? I mean, and I sing it in like, I live in a rural area where everybody's white Christian and I'm singing Iraqi Jewish punk to them. They don't even, there's usually a big pause after I finish because they don't know what just happened. But, you know, so it's everywhere. It's in everything I do, everything I say. It's, it's who I am. It's how I think. Um, but I don't expect to find home, you know, that, that perfect word you used. I don't expect to find home anywhere in particular anymore, except my home. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of go and I handpick one person here, one person there, and I create my own tribe. And it's a motley crew of random people from, you know, all different faiths and ethnicities. And I don't care, but they're all hanging out at my table, singing like Iraqi Jewish songs in Judeo Arabic and Hebrew. And I'm not trying to convert them. I'm just like, hey, this is me. And they like to share and they love it and they gravitate towards it. And that's, that's kind of my jam now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I understand that. I mean, and I think, I think there's a really powerful message there about the power of the personal and the power of individual stories to raise people's consciousness. Right. I mean, I think that's, and I resonate very much with that because that is very much the kind of animating spirit of the Jewish Women's Archive, which is that, you know, everyone has a story and everybody's story matters. And just that fact alone saying like your story matters, that is political. And we often get into these conversations with folks, especially sometimes people who think of us because we're a historically oriented organization, think of history as being sort of apolitical and being sort of, you know, um, being, what's the word? objective or whatever. And I always try to explain like by the virtue of saying like we are centering women's stories and are making the case that these are valuable stories to know that they contribute to our understanding of the world, that in itself is a political yeah. statement, right? And yeah. And I think it and it, you know what you're saying makes sense in terms of that piece of like when you see all the ways that our assumptions about people, whether it's what, who we assume we're going to be similar to, or who we assume we're going to be different from how those can be such alienating barriers that there is a way in which like, okay, so if you don't have those assumptions and you just function on a personal level, you can build, you know, those are sort of the building blocks is those personal stories. I don't know if that's making any sense. Yeah. And, and I think also like some things I was thinking when you were talking, there was a, a journal um, back in the nineties, like the early nineties, when there were feminist bookstores, which were awesome. And I'm so sad they don't really exist anymore, but there was a journal called trivia and it was women's thoughts. And it was really cool. It was this very kind of artsy abstract, just women's thoughts. And it was just a lot of radical stuff. And I loved it. And they called it trivia because women's thoughts are considered to be trivial. So I think what you're talking about, you know, it's a similar thing. Women's like Jewish women's stories in particular are considered not that relevant. And 
And that's, I think, what is really radical about well, what I've always done, I'll, I'll tell a story in a minute, but, but also what I'm doing today is that just by me being this, you know, flaming Iraqi Jewish superwoman consciousness person in everything I do and inviting everyone to my table, that's really radical. You know, when I was in, um, I took a, a Hebrew class, I, I, I walked, I, grad, I graduated Barnard, but I was six credits short because I was the only person in Barnard's history who managed to graduate without ever taking a math class because I was really good at PR even back then. So I sweet talked <laughs> my way out of it every year. And so I still had to take that stupid math class. So after graduating college, they let me walk because it was only six credits. But then I, I went to UCLA after to finish up that. And it took me two years. That's how much I didn't like math. <laughs> but anyhow, so while I was at UCLA, I took Hebrew classes. And I remember that this, um, this, this young woman um, was in our class. She was Black and Christian. And everybody was just like, why are you here? And I remember I like flung around to all of them. And they said, what is your problem? Like, what is wrong with you? Like, what, like, like if someone's taking French, they have to be French. Like, do we have such low self-esteem as Jews that heaven forbid, you know, and then I'm not even getting into like the whole thing, assuming that somebody is black is not Jewish or, you know what I mean? It's just, there's that whole thing. I'm not even going to touch that. Just the fact that, you know, somebody not Jewish is in, is in a class learning Hebrew. It's like, maybe because it's a beautiful language. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. So right. maybe they want to read like, the Bible in the original. Maybe they, yeah. you know. Yeah, or or not, or just I want to learn Hebrew. Like, there's something wrong with Jews. I mean, like we have internalized so much of the crap, and and have come to feel like we're yucky. I mean, even the fact, okay, like people are shocked to find out that you know throughout my dating history, men have often not been Jewish, and it was funny because I was um, I was thinking, you know, my most important relationships were with an Orthodox Jew, a Muslim who was like traditional, not Orthodox, but you know, he kind of went along with everything. A Christian who used to be fundamentalist and, and a Hindu. And I was like, hey, I've hit all the major religions. <laughs> but people are always surprised. They're like, but you're so Jewish. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like my Jewish is not threatened by anyone who's not Jewish. And why do we assume that if someone's going to intermarry, that the Jew is going to end up not Jewish. That's an underlying assumption in that, that intermarriage is the death knell of the Jewish people. You have to assume that the Jew is going to become non-Jewish. Now, why would you assume that? That's Jewish insecurity. Jews are so insecure and we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. And another thing, like I was talking about the radical, you know, that first of all, throughout my life, you know, most of my friends were not Jewish through a lot of my life, except when I was in Orthodox Jewish school, which I left at the age of seven because of racism. But most of the time they weren't Jewish. They knew when Shabbat was. They knew not to call my house on Shabbat. They knew kosher. They would come over and they gamble on Purim. That's what Iraqi Jews do. They participated in our heritage. And I just always thought it was so cool. Like we just have the coolest heritage. Again, I didn't want to convert people. You know, I wasn't into imposing and I'm just like, hey, this is really neat. Want to come and share with me? And they would. And, and I found that was really rare. And I think that's really sad um, that there, you know, I think it's beautiful that Judaism doesn't allow proselytizing and we can go out in the world and share our heritage from a place of love and pride. And, and you know what? People enjoy and people want to share it. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to communicate. People want to, you know, I mean, I'm getting the people out here in this rural area. I've got, you know, usually the men are like, can you please make her go away? Because I'm really radical lyrics. But women are coming up. They're like, that was awesome. Thank you so much, you know? And, and they're getting like new culture that they've never experienced before. And I always tell storytelling before I sing my songs. I give Jewish history lessons, you know? <laughs> you know, in the whitest Christianist area. You know, I'm just like, let's go. Yeah. So- and there was once the, the story I want to tell you, like, um, and, and then I want to get to reading the excerpt because I think it's about yeah, your yeah. music and I want to hear more about, I want you to share more about your music and your journey yeah. with your music. Yeah. You know, when I was, I was working and living, I was living in Israel and working as a journalist. And my, my thing was writing about, um, 
Jewish multiculturalism for American media. And I wrote for top, top, top media. And I wanted to write a story about this amazing Ethiopian teenage girl. Um, among other things, she was an activist in the community. And among other things, um, there was an incident where some Ashkenazi kid made a really disparaging remark towards her and her friends who were Ethiopian. And the guys wanted to just go and like, you know, F him up. And she single-handedly stopped it. And, you know, she was just like wise beyond her years. And she was like, you know, we cannot engage on that level. Um, you know, we have to come from a place of love. Anyhow, I talked the editors. I, I wrote a lot for L Girl Magazine, which was like the teen version of L. And it was really big. I mean, they had America's Next Top Model in there and whatever. And they did not have a section. Like media is very rigid. You have to fit your story into a certain section. They did not have a section that would encapsulate this story. But I flew to New York and I persuaded the editor of the, like, the editor in chief to create a section for me to write the story about this Ethiopian teenage girl. And I was really wanting this because among other things, whenever the Ethiopian Jews were talked about, it was like, you have to talk about the Ethiopian Jews. I'm like, no, let's talk about an Israeli girl. She's representing Israel and she's an Ethiopian girl. Right. That was really important to me. Long and short of it is the army ended up screwing it up. Um, and then they wanted me, they're like, oh, you should use this blonde girl. She's really beautiful. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, <laughs> you are so clueless. I wrote this rant about it. I wrote this really angry article about it. Anyhow, I brought that up because again, I think representation um, and like, I don't, I don't feel I need to go to a Jewish environment in order to be a flaming Jew. I don't feel I have to go into a feminist environment in order to be like a really loud, strong woman, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think like, let's be exactly who we are everywhere and connect on the human level. Um, and, and I think that that being personal, like like you said, it is very political, but it's political, I think, in a way that's more inviting mm -hmm. instead of combative. Right. It, it's palatable. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's like, it's sort of like people don't realize necessarily that it's political. And so it's easier to hear and then meet someone in a real way, you know, yeah. and, that, and, that, and that's, as we know, is how change happens when people actually like know each other, yeah. hear each other's story, yeah, all of that. Exactly. So you've referenced that you're a musician and you write and play Mizrahi punk kind of music. Um, yeah. And I know that that's also been quite a journey for you. And I think the piece that you were going to read is about that. So yep. please share. Okay. So this is where, this is the introduction of the book where I'm talking about how I started fusing Iraqi Jewish prayers with original alternatives and punk rock. And this section is talking about right after I created the first of that kind of song. After a lifetime of bouncing around from Jewish community to Jewish community, never finding my place, I no longer had to. Instantaneously, my band was transformed into a mobile synagogue and burgeoning community, a place where I could create the Jewish world I so desperately longed for. After decades of transmitting Iraqi Jewish heritage exactly as it had been transmitted to me by my father, who had received it from his father and on through the generations back, I was putting my own unique and decidedly female stamp on the tradition. From then on, I began fusing original alternative and punk rock with lyrics about healing from personal and collective trauma with the Iraqi shpahoth, whose themes were on topic. Cancer is my engine, for example, tells my story of healing from cancer through music and incorporates my favorite Iraqi high holiday prayer, which affirms the ultimate healing power of God. I Love My Jufro is a Jewish body positive revolt that incorporates the Iraqi song for the Hanukkah uprising and the mighty 12 rails against the insidious nature of the sex industry while belting out a Judeo-Arabic passage about slavery from the Iraqi Passover Haggadah. A few years later, I additionally launched Shaddai Chants, a vocals and piano duo with a new age take on Iraqi Jewish sacred music for use in meditation, yoga, massage, sacred dance practice, and sleep. 
The debut album, Shaddai, includes songs that instantaneously soothed me when I was a little girl. At first, it felt uncomfortable to create my own blends, in particular with Iraqis in pajamas, given the punk rock genre and radical lyrics. Was I allowed? Did I have permission? Growing up as, and devoted to being, a religious Jew, my orientation was to find precedent somewhere in our 4,000-year-old tradition. But what if I am the precedent? I wondered decades ago as I grappled with the inconsistencies and hypocrisies I experienced growing up, and as I envisioned new paradigms and practices for observing my ancient traditions. At some point, also decades ago, I became willing not only to sing a new song within the parameters of traditional Judaism, but also to step outside those parameters entirely. I was not, however, comfortable with that stance. I wanted Judaism, in particular Iraqi Jewish life and lore, to shape shift with me harmoniously and in concert, just as I wanted my family to heal, grow, and blossom with me. I was not a rebel, and I had no intention of leaving anyone or anything, but, oh, sorry, boldly following the threads of my soul's freedom, truth, authenticity, purity, integrity, and wholeness, however, led me to a place of spiritual and cultural homelessness, as well as alienation from my family and community, while simultaneously leading me to a glorious awakening and to the manifestation of my deepest essence. I referred to the phenomena as crashing waves. At a Passover Seder over a decade ago, the hosting rabbi asked everyone at the table how we conceptualize freedom. There are two layers for me, I replied. There's the freedom where we allow ourselves to act in accordance with our beliefs. And there's the freedom where we stop judging ourselves by the paradigms that we've rejected so as to act in accordance with our beliefs. It has taken me decades to step into the second layer of freedom. We will do, then we will listen, is one of the core tenets of Judaism. Jews do not wait to feel spiritual before praying. We pray, and that act of praying opens the gates to our spirituality. Similarly, I did not wait until I felt ready, or more to the point, worthy, to become a professional musician, to blend Iraqi Jewish prayers with original punk rock, or to sing openly about topics that fester in the darkness of our community behind closed doors. I made a decision to become a musician and put this unique stamp on my heritage, despite my fear and discomfort. And through this act, I've been stepping into my skin, not only as an artist, boldly expressing my soul, but as an active co-creator of Iraqi Jewish history and heritage, thought and practice. And that I came to realize somewhere along the process of doing it is ironically about as Jewish as it gets. Oh, I, hand, I can't hear you. Muted, sorry. Um, you thank you. That was beautiful. Um, you have this piece of asking this question of like, you know, looking for a precedent and then saying, what if I am the precedent? Yeah. And I, I think that is such a just kind of mind blowing idea of just realizing yeah. like someone has got to be the first and maybe it yeah. has to be me. And we don't, even yeah. though like, we're taught to look for to be building on someone else to sort of realize what right. is what if you're meant to be that person for somebody else? It's a real right. reframe. Right. And it can be really surprising because I think we're also taught to outsource to authority figures. And, you know, there's been so many times that I was kind of like looking around, like, how is it that I'm the only person thinking this? I mean, this like, how can other people not see this? And it's like, it's shocking. But it's like, I've just come to accept that now. I'm just, I'm that kind of a person that mm -hmm. I see things other people don't see. I say things other people don't say. And I'm comfortable with the discomfort now. It's like, I'm, it's not even uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not even uncomfortable anymore. You know, it's just, that's just my life. You know, I'm an outlier. It's just who I am. It's just even medically, like medically, I've gone through a lot of health stuff. I'm always an outlier. They've never had like a case of <laughs> fill in the blank before. And I'm like, it figures. It's right. me. <laughs> well, you do talk in your book about some role models, especially musical role models. You, um, yeah. you draw in your interview with the band, the uh, Yemenite women's band, Awa. And yeah. you talk about having met Ofra Khaza years ago. Tell us a little bit about 
both of those role models and what they mean yeah, to you? Yeah, so Ofa Haza, just for people who don't know, so, um, you know, now Mizrahi music is really popular, but it was not back then. So she, she got really big in the 80s and she was super bold because back then all Middle Eastern Jewish traditions were denigrated and those who were religious were trying to be Ashkenazi. And she came out, I mean, she did do a lot of Israeli schlock pop stuff, but that didn't go anywhere. What really took off was when she took Yemenite Jewish prayers and she put it to kind of clubbing dance music, 80s style. And I was living in New York City. I went to Barnard College and you could not go to a nightclub and not hear Ofer Haza. She was everywhere. And it was an awesome FU to Israeli society and the Jewish community in general that was busy you know, just denigrating everything Middle Eastern Jewish because it's like, what is the one thing that put Israel on the charts? It was Yemenite, ha, you know? Anyhow, I loved her. I became completely obsessed with her because I'd never had a role model in my life. I mean, I remembered, I wrote an article called Ofer Haza and Me. And um, when I was a kid, they asked us in class to, you know, write about our role models. And I was like, I don't have one. I mean, it was just, it, it didn't exist. Me didn't exist anywhere, you know? And when she came on the scene, I was like, I've got to meet this person. So I, um, characteristic of how I do, you know, I, I was stalking her in pre-internet format. Um, and I kept getting really close. Like I found a Yemenite restaurant in New York, like an Israeli, a Yemenite Israeli restaurant in New York, where she used to work but she had just left a few months before. So I kept kind of accosting random Yemenite Jews whenever I was in Israel or anywhere they had Yemenite Jews. <laughs> just, you know, just shameless. Can you lead me to your queen? You know, and could not, could not reach her. And then, um, and then when I was, I was living in LA, I had graduated college. I had already, um, launched an organization, student organization of Jews from Iran and Arab countries, which was one of the first vehicles for my Jewish multicultural work. And I flew back to New York to visit my best friend in college who was a year younger than me. No, three, four, anyhow, younger than me. And she, um, she was, um, you know, I had run the Israel group and then she was running the Israel group. And she got everyone tickets to an Ofer Haza concert which just happened to be when I came and I did not know. She didn't tell me and I didn't know, but the tickets were all sold out and it was, oh, it was awful. And then someone got sick and I was like, I did not poison her, I swear. <laughs> and I got the ticket and we went to the concert and the seats were way in the back. And I was like, oh, this will not do. And I just start walking around and I saw there were two empty seats in the front row. So I went and I grabbed my friend. I'm like, there's these two empty seats. Let's go. And I brought her there. She's like, but what if someone's sitting here? I'm like, we'll get up if they come. So we're sitting there. They never came. Ofra Haza comes on stage. Oh my God. I'm going to cry even just remembering it. Mm -hmm. Even as like, what, 30 years later, that woman had like a voice of pearls. It's like she'd open her mouth and pearls would come out. It was just glorious. And I was going crazy because I'm like, feet away from her and I had been trying to find her internationally and and then intermission and I'm like my knee starts bouncing up and down I'm like that stage is really low <laughs> it's really low and then I'm like you know I have my look when I'm when I'm considering doing something and a, a friend of mine is like what's up and I'm like that stage is really low I want to jump on it and she goes let's go. She grabs my hand, starts running down the aisle. And, you know, her impetus gave me energy. So now I like just go bolting forward. Security guards freaking out. They all come running down the aisles. They're like, stop, stop. stop. They catch her. I dive under the stage curtain and long and short of it, it's a long story, but the long and short of it is I met off of Haza. And then I brought all my friends to meet her as well. And, and there are these two pictures that I have, you know, and when she died, it was just so crushing to me, as you can see, like, I'm still emotional, but that woman just single-handedly, you know, put us on the map and, mm -hmm. and gave so many Mizrahi self-esteem that our heritage matters. And for me, you know, I had that self-esteem growing up, but 
I wanted to do this thing that nobody had done. And then she did it. She was doing it, you know? And so I had someone to look at and towards, and it's like, that's where I want to be. What she's doing, that's what I want to do. Now, it's really funny because when I was a kid, my mom kept telling me, you know, I played, I played classical flute and piano at, at a conservatory. And my mom kept, you know, something like Bach, Chopin, all these European men, right? My mom's like, you should like do, you know, the, the Iraqi prayers and blood. I'm like, mom, mom, right. <laughs> stop, mom. And now here I'm doing this. So thank you, mommy. You were the first one <laughs> in my life. <laughs> well, it is, it's, it is amazing to have role models to look up to. And we talk about this all the time, just as, and you referenced this earlier, also the importance of representation. And we sometimes say, you know, if you can, if you can see it, you can be it. And that is so important. And, um, you know, we're lucky to have some of those figures and we're, we at JWA are trying to lift up more that people don't necessarily know about and, and give people back their, their, you know, their heritage, because yeah. <laughs> so much of that does get lost. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on the question of, you You talked about how the anthology first had a different name, mm-hmm. and then you changed it to the Flying Camel, and um, that comes from one of the essays um, mm-hmm. by Lita Levy in the book, How the Camel Found Its Wings. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what that image, I, lo- I love the image of the Flying Camel, and tell us a little bit about what that image means or means to you. Yeah, well, for me, so Lital's essay was talking about, there was a movie that was like this horrible racist movie, um, but she took an image from it about, um, it it was like a camel that was made out of stone and it was, you know, it had wings. And so she was talking about how we are not our mothers or our grandmothers, like, um, you know, and and she, like I, so uh, her, 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 I think her mom, I think is Iraq. No, her mom's Ashkenazi. Her dad's Iraqi. I think I can't remember. It's been a while. Anyhow, she was talking about how, you know, she's born in America, you know, her mom's Ashkenazi. So she's talking about how she's not the same. She's not living the same life. She doesn't have even the same cultural mix. Um, didn't grow up in the same place Didn't you know, grew up speaking the same language as her mother or grandmother, you know, and the anthology has a bunch of different generations and some people are actually from Morocco and some people grew up and some people, you know, and and there's mixed marriages and there's, you know, there's all kinds of mixes in there, which I did on purpose, by the way. But, um, you know, she was saying either way, we aren't what it was and it doesn't exist anymore because, you know, the Jews were kicked out in 1950. So um, she said, basically, we're kind of refashioning our own camel and using the camel as like a Middle Eastern image. And then the objective is to give it wings. So it takes flight. Now, back then, you know, I thought it was really cool. I like the image. I like the concept. So I'm like, let's do that. So it became the flying camel. But when I did that, I was in a really different headspace than Lital because I was still running around teaching about things exactly as they had been passed down to me. Now, what I realized in part in conversation with, um, Tayer Haim from Iowa. It was a really awesome conversation. And, you know, and then I was chewing on it and I was processing a lot. And I was like, I actually, the whole time, the decades that I was, you know, I was really, I was very devout and I was really a purist, you know, and I grew up Orthodox and I was really into it. <laughs> and, and yet when I was passing everything down the way that it had been passed down to me, you know, ensuring that I did it in the purest way possible, even then, by virtue of the fact I was a woman, I already was putting my stamp on it, right? right? I just always identified with the men. Like when I was that, that uprising that you mentioned, like when I was 14, what happened was, I'm going a little segue, but I'm going to come back. What Mm -hmm. happened was once I turned 12 and I was shoved in the back, you know, behind my chaisa, which for people who don't know, it's a four foot wall. It's in the Orthodox synagogues. I would hang over the chaisa. Like <laughs> as much of my body as possible in the men's section. Cause I deserve to be up there. I should be up there. This is, this is effed up. This is not okay. You know, my eyes were always forward, you know, mm-hmm. they should include girls. They should include girls. And when I was 14, I won't get in the whole story, but it's a fun story. But when I was 14, something happened 
And the first time ever I turned around and I looked behind me Mm. and I gasped. I like literally gasped because I suddenly realized the untapped potential. I'll get a little bit in the story. What happened was we were at um, this, uh, my experience growing up was that the Mizrahi Sephardi synagogues would literally change the entire prayer service when one Ashkenazi would walk in. Talk about self-esteem issues. Interesting. So, so this synagogue is an Iraqi synagogue and we used to make pilgrimage on the high holidays. We go down there all the holidays and these three men with booming voices for three years in a row started singing David Melech Israel and all these Ashkenazi songs on Simchat Torah. We have phenomenal Simchat Torah songs. They are awesome. And actually the first song I wrote that incorporates an Iraqi Jewish prayer in my band is a Simchat Torah song because they are so awesome. And it has a whole story behind it. I wrote about it in the book, in the introduction. Anyhow, to get back to this story. Um, so they, they and their big booming voices kept drowning out everybody else singing Ashkenazi songs. Now, Iraqis, at least the Jews, I can't speak to Muslims, but Iraqi Jews are very passive, non-confrontational. So the old Iraqi men would fold up their sleeves, put it in their bag, and they would just quietly leave. And it broke my heart, and I was powerless because I was female, and I was shoved behind this stupid wall, and I was angry as hell. And when I was 14, I stopped trying to out like I tried to out sing these three huge men, right? Mm-hmm. And when I was 14, I suddenly looked behind me and I was like, oh. And I went up and down the women's section and I got them singing our songs. Now, the women always annoyed me. Why? Because they came and they talked. They just came and talked. I was devout. I liked studying. I liked praying. But nobody taught it to them. So what are they going to do? They sit and they talk, right? But I was a kid. You know, it takes a while to figure these things out. Anyhow. So I'm up and down and I chose really simple songs because I knew they didn't know them or didn't know them well. And they suddenly like start to come to life. Now, I think for most of them, it was a gender war, but they were really into it. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, it's that piece of like you bring people in in the way that you can bring them in. Right. Yeah. And we and they got more and more into it. And I was up and down and up and down. We're getting louder and louder. And the men start getting really pissed off. Those three burly men were like, what the hell is going on? And we drowned out the men. And then I crossed the, the um, Chisa, which you don't do. And I walked up onto the Teba, which in the Iraqi synagogue, that's where, you know, the rabbi and cantor are, which you don't do, a girl, mm-hmm. you never do that. And I confronted the rabbi and I said, this is the only Iraqi synagogue that we have. You want to go to an Ashkenazi synagogue? There's like 20, we were in LA. Take your pick, but don't bring those songs in here because we only have this one Iraqi synagogue. And with that, I turned around and I walked down and all hell broke loose because I brought to the surface tensions that had been there, but nobody was saying anything. Mm -hmm. And I said it. Right. And that's also something that people on the outside can often do. It's one of the superpowers of people on the margins and why it's so important to listen to people on the margins because they have a different perspective and can like see and raise things often that are not visible. And yeah, um, and that's a really powerful example of that, I think. Yeah. Um, well, there's so much more we could talk about. I had so many more questions, but we'll have to just do this another time. But thank you okay. so much, Lilwa, for joining us. Thank you. For your really important work, which obviously thank has you. been going on for decades. And, um, you know, rereading this book, I was feeling like there's still, this work is still really, really relevant and important and needs to be happening. And so I appreciate you bringing it to us. And thanks to all of you who joined us and participated in the conversation. As always, there's more to explore at JWA. We put some of the, um, some links in as they came up on topics in the chat, but we'll drop more. Um, First of all, Lula. And if I can say, people can get the book at theflyingcamelbook.com. Excellent, great. Um, Lula is included in JWA's collection on Jewish women and feminism, and we can put that link in there. Um, We have a piece in our This Week in History collection on the Mizrahi Band Iowa that uh, that Lula mentioned, as well as on Ofra Chaza in our encyclopedia. We also have a, a long piece on Mizrahi feminism in Israel, written actually by Henriette Dahan Kalev, who's one of the authors in the book, um, in The Flying Camel. Um, we also have a piece in the encyclopedia on Sephardi and Mizrahi women in the U.S. and on many 
individuals as well. I, we won't put all the individual links in, but we'll put the general pieces. Um, we did a podcast episode about the organization Jimena and their oral histories on Mizrahi and Sephardi women. And that's just a taste. So again, I encourage you to dive in and explore more. Um, please also, I hope people will join us next week, same time, same place, for a conversation with three amazing poets, Irina Klepfich, Joy Layden, and Anne Bookman, who all do different kinds of work and come from different perspectives. Um, and until next time, be well and thank you. Thank you all for being with us tonight. And thank, thank you. Bye-bye. You. This was wonderful. Good night.